Thank you, Beth. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about something which um, uh, is a collaboration between myself and Elizabeth Paul, who's a, a colleague of mine at Bristol. He, she's the psychologist in the, in the team. So if there are psychology questions at the end, I'm very glad she's here because she's going to have to answer them. Um, because I'm not, I'm going to say, I'm an anthrozoologist. I come from a biology background. And one of the things that interests me about the human-animal uh, interactions and human-animal bond in particular is how our kind of biological heritage as primates um, informs that, how it affects the way that we interact with uh, other mammals, uh, in this case, cats. Um, and the, the particular issue that this um, work is about, which is essentially based on a student project by Peter Hiscox, who's the, the third author, um, is uh, about anthropomorphism and how it affects the way that we obtain emotional support from animals. The kind of um, simplistic view might be that uh, we um, project ourselves, our pro project our emotions um, and, uh, and so on onto animals uh, as if they were little people and then we get back essentially a reflection of that. So we assume that they love us and therefore they do and therefore we feel supported by them. Now, um, I'm not saying I believe that. I'm saying that's a kind of oversimplifi oversimplified uh, way of, of dealing with the situation, which perhaps some detractors of the human-animal bond might um, wish to espouse, but, but which, as scientists, we don't. We know there are, that, that is, there is an element of truth in that, um, in the same way that Sam Gosling said yesterday, you know, that there is an, an element of anthropomorphism in the attribution of personalities to animals. Uh, but uh, in terms of emotional support from animals, I think there's, there's been relatively little work done on how much that depends on uh, whether we acknowledge the animal as being a, a, an independent entity with its own set of emotions, uh, senses, and everything else, or whether it is actually totally dependent on this mirror effect of, of us projecting emotions onto animals and then receiving them back again. <coughs> so that is, um, that's what this is going to be about. Um, so, just uh, to, to get a definition up, um, anthropomorphism being the attribution of human qualities to animals, that's the definition I'm going to work with. And um, the, the, the hypothesis then is, we know that pets provide emotional support because people tell us they do, and I think we, should, we can take that at face value. Um, but the many owners perceive their pets as if they were humans uh, in some in some respects, not necessarily completely, although that may be true of a few owners, but uh, in some respects they do, they, they, we do naturally project um, emotions onto animals. Um, and that in some way, this is um, a, quote, a rough quote from James Serple, that anthropomorphism is central to the human-animal uh, relationship. In fact, it, it, some people have argued that anthropomorphism is one of the defining characteristics of Homo sapiens, that we project emotions onto all sorts of things which we know in our hearts, well, we know in our minds don't have emotions, but in, we, we, we like to think of that anyway. So we project our emotions onto the weather and our cars and our computers and all sorts of things. Uh, you know, we curse our computers when they don't work, but we don't really expect the computer to cry uh, as a result. So at one level, we're using this vocabulary, at, very, at the very least, um, to, uh, to give all sorts of things, including inanimate objects, um, uh, human qualities. But um, at the, on the other hand, I think we are also able to detach ourselves from that and say, well, actually, we know really that this is not the case. This is just something I do to make myself feel better. And anthropomorphism from the welfare perspective has real problems for companion animals and again this is an example I've borrowed from James, um, the, the bulldog with the exaggerated facial features which we've kind of created an animal to look like and much more like a human when in fact distorting the skull through modifying the developmental processes has created all sorts of medical problems for this animal and then um, on top of that of course uh, we add insult to injury, um, not as far as the dog's concerned, I don't think dogs care at all whether they get dressed up in <laughs> costumes, um, but uh, we, we do that and we think it's amusing uh, and we enjoy it. So um, th th this is it's kind of an intrinsic part of having a companion animal is, is anthropomorphism um, at all sorts of different levels. And in, in specifically, we, what I'm going to talk about is the attribution of emotions um, uh, particularly. So uh, we attribute emotions to animals. Um, we, we've heard a bit of, in the conference already about the attribution of guilt to dogs and how, whether or not dogs might actually feel something rather like guilt. So I'm not going to, to dwell on this, but um, we, we do do this. Most owners will say, oh yes, I know exactly what my dog uh, 
uh, when my dog's done something wrong, I know because the dog looks guilty. And some of the research suggests that that actually isn't uh, a guilty look at all. It's uh, reflective of a different emotion. Um, so, uh, first of all, I'm going to start with some research done by uh, people at Portsmouth University, um, uh, Paul Morris and his colleagues, on attribution of emotion. So this is going to be our kind of baseline, is what kinds of things do owners actually think uh, animals, and in this case cats, are actually capable of feeling. And I'm going to do, divide these, this is um, a, a, a categorization that Liz has done for this paper, uh, into three kinds of emotions. So basic emotions, which are kind of, which you might call gut feelings, things that don't require self-awareness, um, like fear and anxiety. Relational emotions, which require, at le the very least, the ability of the animal to understand that it is a separate entity from the rest of the world, and that there are other living entities in that world, whether or not it has a theory of mind would be another question. But things like jealousy require that, uh, a, a certain level of self-awareness. And then at a more complex level, self-conscious emotions which require internalized cognitive or even possibly conscious rules to compare, the, the, for the animal to compare its, its current behavior and its past behavior and a set of rules that it's derived from something, um, uh, whether that's simply just the learning of the consequences of previous actions that were of roughly the same kind. And, and things like uh, guilt and pride are, are, are two um, uh, obvious examples of this kind of emotion. And uh, what um, Paul Morris and his colleagues found was that many people, many owners, actually uh, have fairly um, powerful views about, fairly well-held views about what kinds of emotions their animals can feel, and that um, cats, uh, I believe, for example, yes, uh, I think we'd all agree, or most people would agree in this room anyway, that they're not Descartesian machines, that they're capable of feeling fear and possibly anxiety, but that many owners also believe that um, cats are, are capable of jealousy. Not so many think about, I think uh, they're capable of guilt, although most people think dogs can feel guilt, uh, and um, uh, cats, and particularly horses, uh, are thought to be uh, uh, animals capable of feeling pride. So it's a, it's a, this is really the starting point from this study. The idea that there is widespread among pet owners that to, to think that animals have an emotional life which is essentially human-like. Uh, I'm not saying they all do. Obviously, there, there, are, there are people within that sample who didn't, particularly with the more complex emotions. But there are many people who, in fact, a majority of owners um, in many cases, who thought, yes, these emotions are certainly within the repertoire of my animal. So what we did was, uh, and this is uh, to some extent a pilot study, but we um, recruited uh, cat owners from around the university, as one does. Um, we uh, th then gave them essentially three uh, things to do. Um, one was to look at a lot of pictures and some video clips. The video clips, incidentally, came from Dennis Turner, who isn't here, but I must acknowledge um, his help with this, um, uh, and asked them to uh, put uh, their own, in their own words, descriptions of what the cat was think thinking or feeling uh, at the time. Um, we gave them uh, the list, the same list, or a slightly reduced version of the list that uh, Paul Morris had done about how confident are you that your cat can feel, X, Y, and Z. And then we asked them about emotional support. How much emotional support do you get from your cat under nine different situations? So that's, this is an example of, of each, or examples of each one of those. So there's a cat picture um, with, uh, above it, there's a question about what is your, this cat thinking or feeling at this particular moment. Um, and uh, the, the one below is, is how confident are you? That's from, from Paul Morris. And the one on the right is our health and, and support, the nine situations where we, and, and then we just add those up. We've done some um, validity testing on this and it's really a single scale. There's no subscales within those nine items. Uh, people just tend to score some more than others because of their own personal circumstances. Okay, so um, Coming on to the results then, uh, so this is the, um, the beliefs, so this is just a really a replication of Paul Morris's work, what kinds of emotions do you think your cat can feel, how confident are you that they can feel that, uh, and the higher the score the more the confidence in the owner. Um, so the basic emotions which you've amalgamated just for, for sake of simplicity, uh, yes, uh, the maximum score is five, so most people indeed think their cats can feel fear and anxiety and joy and love and, and those signs of emotions. Uh, things like jealousy, um, the, 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 the owners are left, on average, less confident that their cats can feel that. And then when you get to the self-conscious emotions, there's a slight step down again in terms of um, uh, the amount that uh, they feel they can do that. So that's essentially um, uh, just a, a replication of the previous study. 
Um, now, if we compare those three with the descriptors, um, uh, in fact, when we analyzed the descriptors, they would say there were free choice. We didn't put in any words in anybody's mouths or pens. Um, people could just write what they wanted on the lines that we gave them. And we classified, we were able to classify the things into three. One is, is just descriptive. People would describe the cat's behavior. The cat is asleep. Uh, secondly, um, they would describe the cat's emotional state. Uh, they would say um, uh, uh, the cat is happy. And then one category that we weren't expecting but which we separated out post hoc was actually putting words into the mouths of cats. So they put little uh, quotation marks and they go, I'm happy. So we, we kind of we, we thought, well, this is attributional um, because uh, people are actually making the cat speak. Uh, for, the, uh, for themselves, that, that, that's, what that's what they wanted to do, so we should allow them to do that. Um, we didn't actually end up analyzing that. What we found, it was a very strongly demographically uh, uh, based. It was the older respondents who, who almost universally used that method from time to time. They didn't generally use it for every single picture and every single video clip, but the, one, the people who used that occasionally were older respondents, uh, and so we just had to disregard that because of that bias, that, that there could be other biases creeping in because of that. So um, the, the behavioral descriptors really um, didn't tell us very much. What we were interested in was the emotional descriptors, where people had actually spontaneously written down, my cat is feeling X, Y, Z, um, and then did linear regressions with, with those people's scores for each one of those three types of um, uh, beliefs in um, emotions, in basic emotions, in relational emotions, and self-conscious emotions. And we found that the extent to which people used emotional descriptions for, their, for the cats in the pictures um, co uh, was quite strongly related to how strongly they believed the basic emotions were there, uh, which is interesting because the basic emotions is actually a very compressed scale. As you can see, the, the median is right up at the top. So the mere fact that we actually got a relationship there was a slight surprise to me, but it's clearly in the, in the direction you'd expect. Um, the, the, the more they use emotional descriptors, the, the stronger they believe um, the cats can feel basic emotions. The same is true as, of relational emotions. Um, again, the, the more they believe um, the cats are capable of feeling relational emotions, the more likely they are to use emotional descriptions when describing cats. But it was not true of the self-conscious emotions, and, and we don't think there's any kind of statistical problem underlying this was a very wide range of scores for both self-conscious emotions and also for emotional descriptors. So um, we were able to, uh, I think, uh, this just quite an interesting observation, which is, is, I think, something we're still working on interpreting. But it does suggest that there is not just this one-to-one -one, uh, relationship between emotional, uh, put, uh, uh, attributing emotions to cats and uh, describing cat emotions. But the, the key thing was the emotional support, um, which, uh, yeah, we, again, with the people did use the whole scale. Our median was three, around three, when the whole the, the scale runs from one to five. So um, we, we're not, again, dealing with ceiling or floor effects here. Um, uh, so people don't, the, the owners we had, some of them relied a lot on their cats for emotional support, others uh, very little indeed. And then we, we correlated that with the beliefs in um, the emotions. And the only one, uh, if I maybe just uh, start at the bottom and work upwards, um, the emotional descriptions of images and emotional support were not related at all. So there was just simply no correspondence, which you would have expected there to be a correspondence if the anthropomorphism hypothesis was true, that people only get emotional support from their cats if they believe and spontaneously express uh, that their cats are emotional animals. We didn't find that. Likewise, with their beliefs in the more complex kinds of emotions, again, that was not related to emotional support. So again, uh, kind of contradicting the, uh, the anthropomorphism, the pure anthropomorphism hypothesis, that everything is just a reflection back. The only, the only relationship we did find which was, which was robust was that with basic emotions. And so basically what, what this means is that people who, and I'm going to turn it on its head, people who don't get much emotional support from their cats, say, so my cat is there, but I don't rely on it in any way. Uh, it's not really a relationship. I have a cat. Maybe it's somebody else's cat in the household. Those people um, uh, don't have the lowest scores for the basic emotions, so they're detached possibly from cats in general. They're not even sure that cats are emotional animals. They're not 100% confident that cats are emotional animals. So these may be just people who are rather ambivalent about cats in general. Um, so believing that a cat is not a Descartian machine seems to be important to get emotional support from it. 
But projecting your own emotions, the, the, the tendency to project your own emotions onto your cat is not important for, or not related to anyway, getting emotional support back. So the two things are not simply mirror images of one another. They are independent. Uh, what factors determine each one individually is have to be the subject for some future research. But um, at the moment, it doesn't look as if, from this limited data, as if anthropomorphism is essential for getting emotional support. Uh, and so this is just um, a summary. So most owners spontaneously say, yes, my cat is capable of feeling all kinds of emotions, which we might think, uh, as scientists, speaking for myself anyway. Some of them might be somewhat dubious, but uh, people do. Um, but they're less sure about the more complicated ones. And uh, getting emotional support back from a cat, having a strong relationship which gives you a, a good feeling, is dependent on believing the cat has an emotional life of some sort, but not that it's particularly sophisticated. It do that doesn't seem to, to, um, to, to be true at all. So I think, you know, if you had to sum this up, uh, if I have, uh, as I've tried here, is empathy, but not anthropomorphism is required from, for emotional support. And so what anthropomorphism does is, is going to be a, a new question. Thank you. <laughs>